And this is a follow-up on the last one in which we talked about the sciences uh, associated with painting. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I probably made a little bit of a nuisance of myself talking about all these various little things, but it's so easy to uh, conflate um, non-visual elements of the real world with the visual and to conflate, confuse, but also to equate them. And so, um, so Antigua, Antiguus says, if you don't study anatomy, you'll always get it wrong regardless of your surface treatment. And that's the question we're having as part of a discussion. Now, I'm going to uh, uh, suggest to you, well, what I left you with last time was saying to you that there's another science, and there's a higher science than all the other ones, and it's the science related to seeing. What Sargent referred to as retinal, and compared it with the advancement uh, that he brought to painting, thanks to Monet, uh, and, and he said it was equivalent with, with the uh, discovery of perspective. Now, you admittedly, I called perspective a science, <laughs> and I, and so, and all we mean by science really is is a, is, is an aspect of of the of the knowing, you know, bringing to consciousness certain uh, uh, things that appear to be. Uh, true in relation to aspects of what we're doing. And uh, that is probably a very inadequate definition, but I'll leave it at that. But um, let's, um, what I'm going to do tonight is just give you a bunch of, a mixture of quotes and a lot of pictures. And I'm probably going to be a little bit redundant because I want to show you a lot of different people applying this information. And I want to do, I do want to ask you in, a, in at least one case, whether or not you think that person has the anatomy right. But um, so if we can understand, you know, where I left off last week, this big question about do you understand values? That's our world. That's the world of sciences we're talking about now. Not the world of values as it relates to middle tones and things like that and the science of the way light works. But, but values in the sense of, what, of the ocular perception, what, what actually hits the retina of the eye. So Mel, Max Meldrum, I've referred to him before. It's brand new information to me as of about a year ago. Uh, that he'd written this book called The Science of Appearances. Uh, and, and he says the science of appearances concerns the knowledge of what happens to the human eye and its impact with exterior nature. So that's stuff, like other things bouncing off of whatever you see in front of you. So it's, the, it's, it's your eye picking up purely visual data, right? It's one of the earliest and most important forms of knowledge and yet, strangely enough, has found to date no place in the programs of our schools and universities. Now, I assume he means no place in our art schools as well, but that's, um, it's understandable. They may only mean, he may, may, you know, he does say universities, and maybe in those days they had, some of them certainly did have better, more reputable art programs uh, than today. But, but here's Sargent, seeing something else than the object. In other words, he's not talking about Monet, by the way. In other words, conscious of its own medium, that something else, that something else is what the Impressionist tries to note exactly. Okay, what in the heck is that? Something else than the object. So he says, Monet, not content with using his eyes to see what things were, and that's anatomy, right? Or perspectively, or in all those science of the light ways, uh, Monet, not consent, content with using his eyes to see what things were or what they looked like, as everybody had done before him, turned his attention to noting what took place on his own retina, as an oculist would test his own vision. All right? Now, that's a wildly different place. And what's fascinating about it, in, especially in the sense of what this art is, if this is a visual art, meaning its purpose is to give us visual entertainment, uh, it's fascinating it's taken us this long to get here. Uh, and well, I've talked about that before. But I want to show you this Vermeer, because what happened with Vermeer, apparently, is that he projected an image. That is to say, he saw an image came through a lens and hit a flat surface, either a piece of tra a tracing paper, so the, so, the, so the lens could be here, and the tracing paper, the tracing paper on this, the light on that side, here's the lens, Here's the paper. So he could sit on this side, potentially, and see that. And some people have him looking inside the box. Some people have him looking through a hole through the box, which was receiving that image. And there are many, many ways to see what happened to him. But 
what it was, was he, re I call it a faux retina because he was replicating what our retina actually does and what it sees. It's the visual data. It's the actual visual data, color to color. The red is the richest note out there in that particular painting. And the, um, and the lightest note, um, you know, these things, are the, this is the lightest note, shall we say. And all these things land in these sort of categorical places purely visually, not out of some idea or knowledge about light or where it's coming from and all those sorts of things. It's purely visual. So you can see what suddenly happened to, to, to Vermeer was he actually said, oh, that is what the world looks like. And he began, instead of painting out of his head and, and using formulas and all that sort of thing, uh, and this is at a time when people had a, the excuse for using formulas and painting things that weren't very truthful was that they didn't have the uh, they didn't have the pigments for it. But when you look at what Vermeer is doing, he certainly did have enough pigments to indicate that he you know what he had seen, and what he had seen was way more of a of a full spectrum, real world in the same 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 I don't know embodiment as your as your eye receives it, but. If you haven't done this before, pick up a lens, a, you know, um, just, just a magnifying glass and, and stand there in a window with a nice, beautiful, light, bright day. Stand there with this nice, you know, brick building, any other thing on the other side, anything. And let it come through that thing and hold up a piece of paper and move it forward until you can see it. And before you know it, it'll be an upside down vision. But as you glance over, you'll be able to see that that image is a Vermeer image. It's what Vermeer is seeing. And it's, so it's the equivalent of what your retina actually does. Now, why wouldn't it be important if that's actually what your eye does? And we're talking about the, the, the visual world, the, 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 percept, the, the world as perceived by ours. Why wouldn't that be a significant piece of a science when you're trying to actually paint what you see, right? Now, some people are saying they're painting what they see, but they're not interested actually in what they see. They're interested in a story, you know, they're, the, uh, you know, telling their story, making their, making their uh, nude uh, be, a, be, a, be a, some sort of a, a symbol for something or whatever, you know what I mean, and, and have everything as a priority. But for students, how can your priority not be, among all these other sciences, and you know that I haven't dismissed all the other sciences, how can your priority not be learning to see the visual world as it, repli as it, as it plays out? And the canvas is such a wonderful place in that you actually can put all this retinal data on the canvas. And if you learn how to organize it, which is what this science really is, first it's a naming of elements like, like chroma, you know, uh, hue, value, those sorts of things. But then it's an organizational problem after that, isn't it? Where does this, how big is this one in relation to this one? Where does it land in relation to this one and so on, right? And, uh, and what do they do where they meet? You know, well, that's, a, that, that's the most foundational science. And what I was saying to Antiguous last week, to all of you, that you can't even draw bones accurately if you can't manage the value relationships and where they land in relation to each other. So that's where we're going now. This is that discussion of that science. But I'm just giving you a lot more background. So again, when I said values last week, everything you see depends on light and shade, right? Uh, the, uh, you know, we could express gratitude to God, you know, in the beginning he created light and so we could see what he was doing, right? So we could see what he was making or whatever, but uh, he separated the light from the darkness. Well, that's what our eyes do initially and everybody accepts that. We do dark things, light things, we see that that's actually true and it is, but we don't incorporate color. But, so you have to see values and you have to see them rightly related to each other. You have to, you have to practice that until you're really good at it, right? But you have to get that that's a real thing. It's a real phenomenon. Everything's made out of the values and the values being right to each other. Uh, in, a, in any visual ensemble, in the world as you see it, right? And that could be an arm <laughs> or it could be everything, you know, this entire, this entire scenario that I'm sitting in. So, that, so those value relationships, and then there's the value transitions. And the, don't underestimate that, but the value transitions, this guy, uh, Meldrum, talks about the speed of transitions, or I forget, what his, I forget what he calls it, value speed or something. But it's the speed with which a value goes from absolute dark to lightest light. And their speed means what short of distance does it take to get from there to there? Other, some places it gets over a longer period of time. So I'm not, I'm not interested in the way people handle this science. I'm interested in that they get, that it exists, right? The way you handle it is, is entirely yours, but if you don't understand that it's there. So in the world of color, we have the color value, right? Which is how dark and how light it is, literally just nothing more than that. We have the hue. Everybody knows about the relative redness, yellowness, or blueness of a thing. I say all the other colors in between. Everybody understands you could have any, especially these days with the ability we have to make material, to, make, to, to, to print. You can print any color you can even begin to think of, right? Uh, 
So that's the hue color, hue, hue color that way, but also then the color saturation, which is the intensity of the color. And people don't know, unless you understand the science, that the intensity of the color is one of those elements in projecting light. And your picture will not have the same light content if it doesn't have the same intensity. It can even be just some boat, some brown that relative to the whole pic, relative to the whole picture, or relative to life, isn't very rich. But if it's the richest thing in your picture, it'll have a, an element of light that other browns won't contain. Uh, so that's the color saturation, and then the color relations, right? And then color play. You know, when you're watching this thing here, and you're seeing, oh, this green picks up some other greens and some some other, you know, and the skin tones, I, uh, you know, on me or my hair or whatever, they pick up things around here and they play to each other, right? And that's where this beginning of this conversation starts happening about what's the real music of our of our field, right? You know, is it is it a figure that looks like Hercules, or is it actually the play of color, form, light, and all these things that are literally the function of the visual of the retina, right? Uh, what gives you pleasure, right? And I say that meaning uh, strictly as a as a as an eyeball, as a person who's you know, it's almost like going into the room and saying, "Listen to that, listen to that song." And <laughs> people used to do this with Bob Dylan that we loved his. We loved his uh, uh, sort of his quasi profound, uh, pseudo profound, whatever uh, uh, poetry. But golly, it was hard. You're hard pressed to call what he was doing music. And then somewhere a little bit along the way, you heard Linda Ronstadt. And I mean, like I remember being staggered by, by the quality of the music, of the sound, you know, the music. And that's our world. It's the color game. It's all that stuff of the eye. You know, it's, it's like the, the vocal versus the visual. I don't know. But if you're not good at that, where's the fun? And so is it just illustration for you? Uh, and yet the guy who illustrates uh, and who uses this best as an illustrator, who gets that there's also this element of that music, is, of course, a better illustrator than the guy who doesn't. Hence, you must participate in this science as well, right? So then you have the world of angles. I'm going to talk about these other ones. I'm, let me go through uh, a couple of the pictures and talk about just the values and the colors and show you what I mean by this so you don't get confused. Um, I should stop at this one first because in this one here, I'm trying to show you the close-up of the, um, this is the De Joseph de Camp, the blue cup. It's a stunning piece of work by any standards and you need to see it. If you ever go to the MFA, it's, it's, it's probably as close to being the single picture you ought to look at as anything in that museum. And I, and I, and I say that with due deference to Jerome and the, uh, and the eminence Grise and a couple other things. But um, what I want you to observe, though, is the anatomy in this hand over here, right? Because you, you can see the characteristics of that bulge that we all have in this grouping of um, stuff, veins and other things. Uh, the, the massing of the form at the, at, above the wrist, the, the articulation of the bone and the other bone down here and out here. This guy isn't missing anything anatomical, is he? And they look like they're all in the right place. She doesn't look like she has a deformed arm. And I'm betting you that he didn't sit there and do an anatomy thought. Now, it doesn't mean that he wasn't aware whether the anatomy was wrong or not. If he was working on it, he saw the anatomy was funny. He kept working on, well, that value should have been higher. This should have been further over there. And so there's an awareness of anatomy that might have been helpful. But this guy is a painter who painted from effects, right? So he's not into drawing an arm and doing the anatomy on the arm. He's into doing effects. And when the effect, for example, is strong enough, like on this one here, it's strong enough to have to articulate that thing, that, that thing. What do I mean by that? Well, that dark meets light and has a certain transition, a middle tone transition there. And he gets it in the right place. He gets it at the right angle. He gets it the right size. And he gets it the right, um, and it produces that right effect in relation to other things on the page, right? And that's his job, and he's good at it. And he pulls things together and he says, yes, that's, that's you know, whatever he might say. He isn't, if, the, if the wrist looks funny and he understands the wrist, he's going to, of course, say that. By the way, I want to say all humans understand anatomy on some serious level without studying anatomy. In other words, you, we tend to recognize when a thing is off. So that's kind of an interesting problem just on its own. And it's one of the reasons that some of the, the anatomy schools, people, people that teach how to paint by drawing anatomy, they're so difficult to look at because doesn't, nature does not look like that in, in, in so many of these cases. And yet it's not a bad thing to have understood it and to have drawn and all that sort of stuff. I'm not taking that, trying to take that away from anybody. So if you go down to this one, it's much the same thing. You know, his analysis is anatomy of the face in relation to the eye. Or this person, by the way, the same thing. In relation to the cheek, you can't find faults with that. <laughs> with a hang, you could. <laughs> 
But with this guy, you cannot do that. These, these bones appear to be in the right place. The, the, the masses of the muscles appear to be doing the right thing. And I'm willing to bet you that he did it just like this, not from anatomy, but from effects, right? Well, I'm willing to bet, I just know. So, <laughs> um, so what effects does he have to, do you have to work on, right? Okay, so we have, everybody knows about the lightest light, say that, this, whatever, whatever it is, the lightest light, the darkest dark, wherever that shows up. And, uh, and take, here's the lightest light and darkest dark. This one, the, the most chromatic notes, right? These are all categorical places, right, in pictures. And you have this need to be organizing these things in relation to each other, right? So you have two parts of the science. The first of all is understanding of those ideas, chroma, value, uh, light, and then their relationships to each other, right? I say value. I, I, meant, I meant light. Uh, I just meant value, and I, I meant light and dark. Light and... But if you say, if you go to here, and you don't know how to articulate this sharp edge, and don't know when to articulate, and there's more of the science, when to articulate this sharp edge, you'll not know whether, the, whether this value is right. You can put this value down all day and make it look right to this one or this one or some other ones, but until you have that edge there, until you have the edge play between this one and this one, you'll not be sure. You can't be right. You can't know you're right. It's just, you're just guessing. So the edge plus the contrast plus the intensity equals light, right? <laughs> and how much light is, is a function of the relationships within the picture? We, we don't paint the sun with the yolk of an egg, right? We don't, we're, it's, we're, it's an impossibility, right? Um, so... Yeah, but that's the, that's the ocular world. That's the retinal world. All you see up here is a, a, a redder red, a, a more neutral one here, a, a darker yellow here, a lighter yellow here, things like that, a greener yellow, a, a whatever, and various things like that, right? And you see the value play from one to the next to the next to the next. And your job is simply to organize it and to be good at organizing it. And that in itself is its own science. That takes a ton of practice, right? So, in a sense, we're naming all those things you have to be able to do to be good in basketball, and then you still got you're going to be thrown onto the floor, and you have to run up and down doing all these things that you're just if you're just busy thinking about them now for the first time, you're not going to do very well. <laughs> You'll be tangled up in your own feet and so on. Uh, so, the world I'm getting at though is is a fairly simple one. Every single one of these pictures, you're going to see the same thing. You're going to see the order of effects, the order of edges. See the sharpness of this edge here. What does it compare with? Well, it compares with this one, and it, and it compares with this one. This one wins, right? But that's the order of the effects, this, or, and the order of the edges, plus the contrast, as I said, that produces the, the effect. And so there's a series of these things that live in their own family, just like reds live in their own family, or the blues. They live in, these, in their family relationships, and they have to be right to each other within that relationship, and they have to be right in the world of contrast, right? One of the things you don't have to understand if you're doing our world is you have to understand the world of relationships, which is a two-part world. It's actually three, but the third one is complex enough that if you can't do the first two, you're not going to deal with it. The contiguity is what it's called. I was a student, went, went to the encyclopedia when Gamble, Gamble started talking relationships, and other people did too, and I just finally decided to think this through per Gamble's uh, desire. And uh, I went to the encyclopedia, rather, and looked up the word relationships, or I think it was there as relationships. And uh, they described the Greeks. The Greeks figured out what, their, what the relationships were, right? And they are, they are similarity, contrast, and contiguity. That's what they came up with. And apparently nobody's actually done anything different. I've not seen any reason to think about anything different. But this here is contrast, right? And when you see a hair like this value disappearing into this, that's a similarity. Or when you see this value and this value appearing to be the same, they're similar in value. Now, this one may be bluer, while that one is, you might say, redder. Or this one may be more chromatic, while that one may be less chromatic. You're still dealing in a world that has, uh, they're, they're, where they're, they're like this way and they're different that way. And that's our world. You have to be good at it, okay? It's, it's really kind of, <laughs> you know, and I don't mean to take the joy out of this because actually what happens, and the thing I think you really have to be best at is beauty, right? Because if you don't see what about what this is doing to this, playing to something else, and how interesting that is, right? And if you don't find the play of lights, the play of edges, and the fascination of those things, first of all, you won't be able to take it to the level of music because you're not playing with the right stuff. You're not playing the stuff of our eyes. <laughs> but even to be accurate, you've got to, you've got to see these things. You can see the precise relationship, say, of this light right here to this one, to this one, and the way they and the way they played with each other. You have to be a listener. You have to sit in the woods and just be Wordsworth. You have to just listen to how the fun, where the fun hits, and then all of a sudden you say, "Ah, I get, I get what's happening," and you see it like in sets, like the long line. You see it in sets.
Um, so in the lay-in, you can see how this is operating differently. There's no preliminary drawing of outlines of objects and anatomy and all those things. Each one of these persons is doing some anatomy, like the bone structure of the head. There's, there's anatomical rightness, areas like this. The, um, the, you know, even the presence of, the, of ankle suggestions, the shape that relates to anatomy, is being done by effects. By, by relative contrast, by right, the right color to the right color in the right place, at the right angle, and so on. And, um, and so everything we're doing here and setting up the page, we're getting the effects, this light effect here, right, to get the exit out here, we're getting this light effect, right? So we're doing all the drawing, including the locating the design on the page, by getting the effects, the light effects, right, to each other, right? Now, if you don't know how to make a light effect, and that was a big deal for me, it was one of the first things that I finally broke through <laughs> Uh, in the Brackman world when I was just a student, like any number of other people that you all know, uh, friends online, David LaFell I think was, but I, maybe he wasn't, but uh, uh, Daniel Green was and others. But the idea of actually embracing the Impressionist mindset um, and hearing what they have to say is a pretty big deal. But the essential thing, the key thing, the two things that were said by Brackman, one is all relationships. And he would keep saying, I don't see the light yet. I don't see the light yet. And you know what I mean? And so one day, one day we came in there, and he's looking at a couple, a painting of one or two people over there, and he said, you guys have the light. And that kind of a thing is like, this is very stirring, you know. Oh, I, now I see what you're going for. And I looked at it, and I said, and I said, you know, it's not very accurate. It's not that light. But dang if it isn't lit. It has that feeling of light. And whenever a dark meets a light, there is a feeling, there's an element of light. Even when this softer edge one over here meets, that sense of light here, you have to have a capacity to understand that. This is that science, okay? This is not the science of anatomy. It's bigger than that. You can't make a bone without understanding the science. <laughs> okay. And then, by the way, so in, in all these cases, here's the darkest dark, the lightest light, this is our science, and then where they are in relation to each other, and who's on first in terms of the, of the contrast, and then who are useful in terms of the placement to play, you know, all these locating places and all those sorts of things. There's a whole lot of that to that craft, which you're going to have to learn to sort out. But in each case here, you can see that this, these guys have articulated the order of the edges. This is a sergeant, by the way, this is my copy of a sergeant. But I was just copying it. I think it was a finished work, but I was copying it to see if I could understand the way he likely approached it, if he did it like we do. And that was my approach there. So you can see how I made something out of this. And so just any number of places, you know, everybody gets that you make something out of that. But why did I make more out of this and less out of that? Well, that's what he'd done. He had that sort of, you know, or like what here, you know. And uh, certain inside, like this inside edge and this, this cut right here. This is the visual order. Look how strong that guy is, you know. It's very strong, and it has to be right to this one, right? And to everything else that has that kind of play in it, you know. You can say, it's easy to see maybe these sharp contrasts with the fairly lit, this one, this one, and other, others like this one, even that one. If you see those things and you, and you can get them rightly related to each other, you'll be able to win in our game. So, um, but in the world we're talking about values, uh, uh, you can see in the, in the, in the Benson on the right, uh, we're talking about spots, right? These are spots of value. And so here's the darkest dark, and there are various ones spotted around. And the way they're deported, right, is, 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 is what you have to be good bit about doing, right? The music is not in the fact that they're ducks. It's in the placement on the page. <laughs> and that's our science. That's, that's the science of the... Uh, and by the way, it can become just a purely abstract science in which you say, well, I'd like it here better than there because... And you have to have a good, really good reason, which that's another discussion. But you can see that he's got, you know, lightest lights, whatever the big picture is a light. Then he has these middle tone spots doing their thing at different sizes to each other and having their own gestures and all these things. You have to be good at values, right? That's all I'm saying with that. In this one, you're, here, you're going to hear a little bit later, you're going to hear Monet talking about the transitions. And when you see lights, and of course Monet's painting outdoors and he's doing fields full of one note, basically, but the color movement within them is a huge thing. He, at first he calls it tone, but then he changes it to mean. It's clear to me he means color. But you can see the peachiness of this white dress here turning into the cooler uh, whiteness of this dress with a slight value shift. These kinds of movements are part of the music. You'd be good at them, right? Not just the movements that make form, like you see in the woman's neck here. That's an important thing to be skilled at, right? We're talking about this is what your eye is doing. You have to grasp it. One of the thing, points I make it later on is you have to be able to grasp it with your mind's eye beforehand. In other words, you look at it and you wait till you see to have, till you see, to have ownership of it. If you know it's a value transition, you've got to own what it's doing. 
So there's there are elements to that that you have to be, just get good at. And again, I'm talking about just to draw the anatomy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the tube is part of the anatomy. If you can't articulate the tubularness of that particular piece of anatomy, then you're not in very good shape, right? You won't be in good shape. But um, but the transitions, one of the things that's really amazing about him, and I in the blue cup previously, I wonder if I can show you that. In the blue cup, um, the background wall, you can't see it well here, but he appears to have been working in a studio in which um, there was a brick wall. And he would have his window shade up some, but the brick wall seemed to go up, and, and the sun would hit the brick wall. This is the north-facing side. It would hit the brick wall and hit some of, of her. And then further up, you'd see cooler notes all down through here, and the wall would be moving, getting redder as it went to the top. And there are a number of his paintings, including a really interesting portrait at MIT's collection, that just shows that astonishing transition. But it's, he's literally finding the beauty in the, the color movement in a wall. All right. So there's that, and the idea of the starts and how it's different. So, yes, it's the fading and passing tones within a tone. It's a nuance, for example, between the blue and the yellow. It's something that can only be expressed in painting. Now, why is that? It's because it's something that's purely ocular. If you don't, the, the canvas, the, the canvas you're painting on is your retina, <laughs> if, you, if you follow me. And therefore, all you got to be really good at is being objective about color value relationships, size relationships of those things. Follow? And... And, and keep it simple, stupid is really a very good way to think about it. But he's finding, in what he's doing, he's finding that you can't draw the human face. We, get, the, get the unity of the head and yet not have the movement from, from gold to, 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 to the reds, to the greens, you know, as they, as they evolve, as they move, and, um, and, and still have unity. And he's finding ways to do it outdoors that are very similar to what you would do indoors, say, with a pastel. So there's Monet doing it, and you know you you know what he's doing out there. He's just going out there and trying to make what he sees in 20 minutes. He's trying to make all the notes in right relation to each other, and seeing if that what that does, right? Much in the same way as as, as Vermeer when he's looking at the screen, he says, "Man, I wonder if I can do that." And he moves over to his canvas and tries to imitate those notes, try to match those notes side by side, and see what happens. Because you know, in in a sense, he's sort of anticipating what something good is going to happen, and then but he doesn't know. He hasn't been there before. Uh, this is Vanna, uh, this is Vinton, I think. Uh, these are the Americans. He thought highly of these guys uh, and their ability to see light. Oh, that's a Metcalf, I'm sorry. Willard Metcalf. But the Americans really did pick up on this, loved it. Uh, there's, there are parts of France that are very like uh, New England in their sunlight. And, uh, but, uh, but you can see the wild difference between these things, and yet everything is about, look how it changes from green to red. That's what you've got to be good at. Keep thinking about haystacks and the anatomy of haystacks, and you're going to be in so much trouble. <laughs> you're not going to be playing with the music. You're going to be playing with the stuff, things and stuff, right? You're, I think of it, I tell the women in my studio that they, when they do that, they're telling them they're the material girl. you got to stop being material girl and start getting to beauty. <laughs> but you can see uh, uh, Soroy is applying the same information. Look at the wall here, the transition from, from cooler to warmer, because that's the way it was, and how he's playing the, the reds here, getting that really rich one jumping over to here to one less so, and you see this grand movement of some of these notes through here. And you see the beautiful relationship of the three blues, or four blues if you want to count that one, of these by light, by, by value, etc. You see the order of edges, the contrast in edges. Now he had a tendency to, to, to block objects and so he sometimes would get extra edges, where other people like Boston School guys tended to have more of a lost and found approach. But the truth you're getting here that's what your skill is looking at. That's what you're trying to be skilled at, actually. Can you master the truth of the impression of whatever comes to your eye? Because that's the first science, right? Because that's what you're doing. Every minute you're doing with your brush, that truth. And, uh, and of course, eventually you'll get tired and sick of doing illustration because there's so much more music to be had. <laughs> that's, me, that's me being uh, uh, full of myself, so to speak. No, but I'm not kidding. I'm not doing that to be, uh, to be uh, a joker. This is serious stuff. I have not found the pleasure... When the lights go on in the picture, when the color play sings, I'm, I know I'm in the right place. And I was the guy. I, was, I did imaginative pictures with Gamble. I still have a bunch of them on the, on the easel. <laughs> but if they're not beautiful this way, they're no, not even interesting to me. I don't care what the subject is. Isn't this a marvelous thing, by the way, the evolution out of this brilliant area, this high chroma, into these lesser chromas, you know, and then out to the grays out as you, as you feel this thing, right? A really magical kind of, that's the kind of stuff that is the color play that if you see it and get it, you win, right? You're there, you're the artist. 
Until I, a realist isn't an artist, it doesn't have anything to do with anything. Um, that doesn't mean there's not beauty in form, by the way, and I don't mean to say that, but form is not realism. Form is form. Our world is, form is one of our players, right? Uh, and one of the forms is flat, right? Like the wall in the blue cup, that flat, the flatness of the wall is one of the forms. But the form of the neck that you saw, it's very important. Can you, do you know how to play with form? Do you know how to make form? That's our world. That's our abstract world. And so is size and all those things. Look at the nuance. These are three different days. This is, uh, this is, this is New England. Uh, don't, this one might be too. I'm not sure that it is, but, but this is um, uh, a Bunker, and this is Vinton, and this one is Vana, I believe, again. And here you are seeing the beaches, which could very well be the, the Essex or someplace, some New England, uh, you know, Cranberry Bog or whatever, or just the beach, uh, near the beach. And, uh, but what you're seeing is color light play, and you're hearing music in these places. And if you don't see what that is and don't see what the value of that is, you may belong in a different business. And I mean, like literally an illustration or something like that, which is fine. Uh, you can see these. The, now, this is the intensity question, right? First of all, this is a low-value picture, low-value contrast. A lot of the tonalism world thinks like that. Uh, this is high contrast, but also high chroma. This one, this one has a high chroma, but it almost looks funny in the context of this picture. At least this reproduction does, and I think it doesn't look that bad. In the, that raw, this, it's sort of off a little bit in the intensity here. But, but this, this intensity, that intensity you have to be able to achieve to get this quality of light. You also have to get the right quality of edges and the right quality of intensity at the reds in those places if that's what's making it happen, and so on, right? But you can see all these guys are playing with the same toys, right? It's color values and their relationships with each other, what happens where they meet, right? So you can see transitions. This, this is one of those things that Monet was just talking about, this transition from here, right through here by value and getting cooler or warmer or whatever and then changing again as it goes, right? So that's... That's the, that's the stuff of the retina, right? And if you know how to articulate sort of the effects at key places, you actually will have the stuff of human beings uh, hanging out. So Sargent claimed, uh, and this is Monet talking, Sargent claimed that Sargent himself wasn't an Impressionist in the sense that he, Monet, understood the word. And they all decried the word Impressionist. It was a sarcastic thing done to them to ridicule them by, by some writer, some art critic. Uh, but he said he... Sargent claimed that Sargent himself wasn't an Impressionist in the sense that he, the Monet, understood the word because he was too much under the influence of his teacher, Carlos Duran. Carlos Duran drew his inspiration more from the Spanish school of Velasquez, which put its emphasis on correct values. Now, we're still talking about ocular, right? Because the world of values is really the key world. If you're being truthful, then we know what the light is light and dark is darker, and we know the general tonality of the picture, and we know the order of the edges, the contrast, and their edge sharpness. We, that'll, it'll produce a lot of the same stuff. It doesn't bring you all the way there, but it'll produce the bigger part. It's, the values are that important of, of, the, of, of, of light. So much so that you would say, uh, you could see how a person like Sargent wouldn't particularly feel the need for anything more than that. So this is early Sargent. In both cases here, I think the Boyd thing was done way back. Uh, and by the way, there is a certain element of color here. It's not like he doesn't see color at, at all. It's not like that at all. But you see his early one here, this, this has, you see it at the Clark Museum, it actually has a remarkable feeling of, uh, of grayness, it's just like a general grayness. And you see that a lot, oddly, in uh, Soroya's uh, portraits as well. Uh, it's almost like they're operating from a formulaic mindset, or a values-only mindset, color doesn't matter. And I, I, you can understand that if you're thinking of portraits as photos of somebody, like, like snapshots of somebody. But nevertheless, you see what the visual world, even to... Uh, to uh, uh, um, to Carlos Duran was, though, but it's the order of effects, right? There, there's an effect. This is, these are key effects. People will tell you that this can't be in focus. Look at this focused effect down here. Off, because it's too far out of the center. It's nothing to, we don't, they don't do camera lenses. They do the retina. And when we look at the retina, one of the things you've got to be good at in our little field here, and I'm sort of listing these things now. Understand that's what I'm doing is you've got to be good at seeing the thing as if it were a two-dimensional flat thing already. So as if it were just a purely retinal image with no knowledge this way. You don't want to know deep. No, you just want to know the relationships of things this way. <laughs> That's the gift of the retina. And it's the mercy of it, too. And you wind up with the third dimension and, uh, because you've made those relationships right by value, by contrast, by edge. All right, so this, I wanted to show you this because uh, the picture on the left is a sergeant, which we always liked to admire when we were young. There's a wall in Capri that he did at some point in his life, fairly young. And then uh, 
uh, this is Hibbert, who went to the same area. He's in Capri. And doesn't it look, I say this to students from time to time, doesn't it look like Sargent never saw color? He's got a wonderful light effect, but it's all being done by values and edges, right? By contrast. And uh, to a much lesser extent, a little bit of chroma doing some stuff. Yeah, because it does. But, but this is that search for the, the color note and its distribution throughout a painting. Uh, you know, so this note, green, is related rightly to all the other greens in a painting. That's the way he was raised, trained. That's Boston School training, by the way. Uh, Hibbard is, is, is a graduate. He's a graduate, and he's on, his, he's on his traveling scholarship, whatever they call that, in those days, and you have to return with work. Uh, but most of them, he's a landscape painter, and a very good one if you need to look him up, H-I-B-B-A-R-D. Um, spent time painting the, the, the snowy hills of Vermont, uh, primarily. But you're seeing a different guy here, aren't you? S same age, roughly, maybe even a little younger than Sargent, when Sargent did this. Probably not by much. But he's out here seeing something that Sargent had not yet seen. And, uh, and that's the complete ocular... It's the, it's the complete picture, ocularly speaking, right? That is to say, the one that, that, it, that, that accepts that the color values have to be right at the same time. The, not the colors, but the colors and their values, not just their values. So Monet bowled me over, says Sargent. And he counts as having added a new perception to artists, as the man did who invented perspective. One of these days, some genius will turn it to account and make it part of the necessary equipment of an artist. Well, I, I think the Boston School is that group of people. And, and I know that this guy, Meldrum, has written the book called The Science of Appearances. It's a very tedious way he has of presenting and full of, full of writing, you know. But if you can pass, if you can read through it rather quickly, you're going to pick up these crucial central ideas at, that are very much the science that Sargent is looking for. Bowled me over, though. And you know he didn't. It changed everything. So there's Sargent on the left. Does that even begin to look like the girl at Capri? And it, and it just gets more spectacular. I could show you all these watercolors and stuff. The one on the right uh, is, is Soroya again. And you can see these guys are all into the same kind of values play and the, and the relationships of edges and contrast. And it, believe me, it's not, it's not knowing girls and knowing dresses and knowing water and knowing beaches, guys. The world is too big. <laughs> <laughs> the, the world is so full of a number of things. The only way you're going to be happy as kings is if you know how to manage it ocularly so that nothing surprises you, nothing happens surprises you. Somebody once asked me, isn't the hand the hardest thing to paint? And at the time, I, I mean, I was, at, at one time I thought that was true. Would have been, you know, it was very difficult, all these fingers and all this stuff and the complexity of it all. But when you become ocular, when you start operating from value masses and sizes of things and those kinds of things pure, purely, then it's not any different from anything else you paint in the entire painting. It happens to be a smallish area with often some complexity. But the complexity is all that's difficult, not the complexity of the way, the treatment's all the same. It's values and how big they are, how, how they compare with other things in the picture, and what happens with the edges. And I say what happens with the edges, and I do mean shape, because shape is one of those things you've got to be good at. So that's that world, guys. <laughs> so if you're not good at that, you can't have this, but you also can't have bones, okay? That's, I insist. <laughs> You cannot have bones, not with any kind of accuracy. So I guess, uh, I guess that was it. Yeah, actually. So thank you very much. Uh, let me actually let me before I stop. Let me go back to the beginning of this, so you guys can look with me at the um, um, at that list and see. Let me just see if there's anything I've left out. I'm sure this has already run too long. Yeah, but uh, go, keep looking at that list. Keep thinking that list through. And I'm going to pull up, if I can do it, I'm going to pull up the slideshow one more time. And uh, let me just walk you, get, me to, get you to my list here. So this is the list, right? And so I've talked about everything in here. Form, including flatness, roundness, and form shifts. I've talked about shape, but not much. So I haven't talked about the complexity of shape, but you've got to be good at that. You don't have to draw outlines of objects to draw shape, to understand shape, to be master of shape. Um, uh, the organization of the relationships. You have to be good. That's the most rich thing and what the other colors are all in relation to it. Uh, the, you know, the, what's the red, the yellow, and blue, shall we say, of a picture? You have to be good at that. You have to be good at... Um, so there's that organization of those relationships. The conceptualization is a big thing. And I didn't say much about that, but you ha I did say a little bit, though. You have to, you have to be able to preconceive the idea of the form movement. <laughs> and everything we do, because it's purely visual, though, becomes predictable. And you wind up with a shorter vocabulary. And I've compared this to phonics, right? Phonics is a science. If you don't know that, you might want to think about that. Phonics is a science too. And 
And this is, so phonics reduces what would otherwise be an incredibly complex language, like Chinese is like, I don't know if it's a some million number of figures, but, but, but English, we, it's a phonetic language, it's sound-based. So we figured out what's a, a letter that would be a symbol for the sound, and we realized there are only 44 sounds in English language. So all kids have to really learn to be good at reading is that. And you don't even have to read, learn all of them to get the hang of how that works, and then and then just you'll be you'll gradually pick up being really good at it. Well, this is the same game. This is exactly the same game. This is I'm going to call this the phonics. You know, this is this is the phonetic, but instead of phonics, why don't we call it the visual edics or something? You know, what I mean? <laughs> somebody come up with a good word, the uh, the eye edics or whatever. What is that? Be ocular edics. <laughs> but we're talking about the world of the ocular, and it's so simple compared to the world of anatomy and the anatomy of trees and the anatomy of folds and the anatomy of all these other underlying ideas that relate to reality, but not to the world of sight. Anyway, so, and then I mentioned paid handling and, and, and best methods and all that sort of stuff. The best methods come to you once you accept this is what the science is and you have to be good at. And you'll have to separate yourself from all the other things and get good at this and then look back and say, now where do I incorporate all these other things that I thought I knew and maybe, and maybe rightly at certain points, right? So the idea of proportions, I didn't talk much about that, but of course, proportions, one, one of the things I should mention, and I, let me see if there's anything else. Yeah, I mentioned proportions, I mentioned angles, and I should do that. Let me go do it with Sargent, because he's the guy that talks about points and angles. So when, when you're doing proportions, we mean proportions in every kind of which way, right? But when you have a point up here, let's just say you have, oh, this point right here, and you have another point somewhere else, and a third one right there, then you have to be good at angles. First of all, you'll be able to articulate that as a point. This thing here is a point, and that one is a point. And then you have to be good at getting this angle right and the distance right between these two, comparatively, and the angle right between this, and the width right here between, between the length of this and where it would cross here, or beyond that, the width of this, when you get that in, and, and how wide it is in relation to this, right? So that's the entire world of the relational as it pertains to proportions, right? Well, you gotta be good at that because we are organizing this world, right? And, and where things land in relation to each other is what creates the figure. And don't, don't think, by the way, that because I'm telling you all this that we somehow dismiss the figure. Our goals are the same as yours, to paint a likeness of what we see in front of us. The beauty and the great value of the way we approach it is that you're not just gonna get the anatomy. You're not just gonna, what was that line in The Beautiful Mind? You're not just gonna get the girl. You're gonna get, you're gonna get the music of the day, the light of the day, the, 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 the color shifts. You're gonna get so much more than you ever bargained for, and you'll find that you must do it. So read that, 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 I think page 17 maybe in Hale's book on Vermeer and, um, and there's plenty of other stuff. Read the Velasquez book by Stevenson and you'll begin to understand more of what I'm talking about. But this was finally determined to be the latest, greatest breakthrough and what Sargent and all those guys were doing wasn't because they were dummies or, or lesser men or didn't have the opportunity. Sargent had every opportunity to have every education anybody else did. He chose these because there were greater advantages in them. And that's the, so hang out with this ocular science for a while, see if you can figure it out and what, how painting looks you know, when you paint from an ocular point of view. So that's my recommendation and, and thank you for your patience in this one. This has been a long one. Um, and see you next time.